So now to finish up this chapter, we're going to be discussing the prohibited activities, the things that we are not allowed to do. Market manipulation. This is the deliberate attempt to interfere with the free and fair operation of any market. Somehow, some way, purposefully increasing or decreasing the value of a security. There are several ways that this can be done that we will be discussing. Most of these, as I want to make sure and stress, most of these we want to make sure are in the, are in the names of the, of the questions where we shouldn't really be struggling with is this legal or not. The question in a lot of ways, we should be practicing these to where we recognize that what they're talking about is illegal. Maybe we forget the name. So we do want to make sure we remember the names because they could be asking. Try to develop what I call as a, as a bad taste for these. When you read them, you should sort of have a, a bad taste in your mouth as you say these things, as you're reading them. That means they aren't allowed to be done. That sounds wrong to you. Sometimes when you watch me taking cue banks with students, when you see my reactions, you'll see me reading questions and I'll look away because as I read the question, I go, like, that just, I look at that and go, yeah, that's very illegal. Can't do that. And I make a face. And so I try to not reveal that. As I did say, I do play poker. When I play poker, I don't make a poker face. It's nearly as bad as when I'm looking at these questions. But some of them are real, real bad. And in a lot of times when they ask these questions, the answers are going to be something like it's legal because, or it's legal because of a different reason, or it's illegal because, or it's illegal because, or unethical, or you can't do. So if you get that bad taste, you're down to 50-50. You know it's not legal. You may not remember which way, the reason why it's illegal, but that's a coin flip. As you watched my test tricks video, you know my feelings on coin flips. I love coin flips. Look at it, because cause you read the question, you get a bad taste, you go, it's illegal. You go, oh, I don't know what it is. Guess C, guess D, move on, mark it, move on. And it takes 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah, come back later, but you've got a 50-50 chance already. Coin flips are our friends. Don't forget that. Investment broker. Just sign here, sir. It clears me of any responsibility. This is referred to as a, what's called a hedge clause. They're illegal in all cases. They, they are unenforceable. You cannot have a client sign away their rights to whatever the law says they have the right to. They can sue you for fraud or for theft. You can't have them say, we are not held accountable if our clients, if, if, if our representatives steal from you. Oh no, they're held accountable. You can't sign that away. So the unethical practices. One of the things that we have to understand, and when we talk about later with market makers, we're going to explain this a bit more, is that when shares get bought and sold, the actual idea, the, the act of buying or selling, adjusts the price of the stock. If I am going to be buying a large number of stock, I know after that, the stock price is going to go higher. So I went and saw one of my rich clients who placed 50,000 share order with me. I know after that 50,000 share order is placed, the stock market price is going to be higher. So, I mean, no harm. I go to my account and, and I buy a few hundred shares for myself and then put my client's order in. I mean, what's the harm in that? I'm, no, one's, no one's getting hurt there. Well, the idea of what I just described is basically running in front of the order. It's called front running. Someone who knows of a large order that is going to be processed and puts an order in before specifically to benefit from that change in price. That I buy a few hundred shares, place their 50,000 share order, and that is then going to be uh, the, make the price significantly higher. After that, I sell it. The agent is running in front of the large order. Same idea with selling, except that you gotta sell short, gets a little bit weirder on there. But if you sell a large amount of stock, the price is gonna go down. Just like if you buy a large amount, the price is gonna go up. Rumors. Spreading false gossip, rumors, untrue things about a security for personal benefit. Generally, we're gonna be talking about these with pump and dump schemes. Pump and dump schemes are buying a large amount of some cheap stock then artificially increasing the price, usually through rumors, 
through other lies to get people to buy it. And when people are buying it, the price is going to go up. So once the price goes up, we sell what we have at a profit. So let's say I use, I buy 10 million shares of stock, two cents a share. Cost twenty thousand dollars. I use twenty thousand dollars to buy ten million shares of a really cheap stock. I then go and spread rumors, telling my clients, telling my friends, putting it on the internet, uh, spreading all different things, creating fake accounts so it looks like multiple people are talking about it. Get multiple people to talk about it. Pay some of my employees to talk about it, and the stock goes up to five cents. Not a lot. I mean, I only gained three cents. It's not that much. But then I sell the stock. But at five cents, my 10 million shares are worth 500,000. That's a cool $300,000 profit. I am now no longer pumping it. There's no reason for me to pump it anymore. I made my money. So I stopped, I stopped pushing it. Everyone starts going, wait, no one's talking. Wait, is this bad stuff? I'm going to sell it. And when everyone sells it, it goes back down because no one's talking about it. And I just artificially made money. If you go and look up pump and dump and cryptocurrency, you can see that there are people that are going and pumping and dumping cryptocurrencies. I saw a commercial for an organization that did specifically that. Cryptocurrencies are not regulated. There's nothing technically illegal about that other than talk about a bad taste in one's mouth. Marking the open or the close. The idea of marking the close or marking the open, because uh, they're very related here, is that market manipulation of the price. If we buy a security at the very end of a trading day at a higher price than the current market value, it's going to make the, 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 the close price look more to artificially raise the closing price. Same idea with marking the open, placing an order at a slightly higher price or sale orders the lower price right at the beginning of the market so it looks like the opening price is a different price than it actually would have been. Now the marking the close is generally used for if you're in a short position for what are like margin calls and uh, maintenance calls basically. You don't really need to know why they're done. But you need to understand that marking the close or the open is designed to artificially change what the price should be of that uh, security or what it should look like. Backing away. Market makers, which we are going to, going to discuss in more detail in the chapter on people, are um, institutions that promise to always be willing to buy and sell a security. They will quote a price. They will quote a bid and an ask. They will quote what they're willing to, to pay an investor for it, what they're willing to pay, what they're willing to sell to an investor at, and they are always willing to publish them. Backing away is them not honoring one of those quotes. They pu publish a quote, someone says we want it, and they go, oh wait, that was a mistake. Very, very bad. I mean, they lose, I think it's 30 days or something where they can't be a market maker if they do that. These things are serious. The penalties are quite severe if they're a little bit off. The reason market makers exist is without them, the markets wouldn't work very well. They are integral and vital to the free flow of market that, that we have and the ease of buy and sell that we enjoy. Free riding or withholding. This is a practice where an underwriter does not make a legitimate public offering of a hot issue. Underwriters are investment banks that are designed to bring issues to market. They usually are going to work in what's referred to as a syndicate, a group of underwriters. And one of those underwriters might look at it and go, you know, I actually think the stock is worth more than this. I want to, I want to hold on to a few shares so that in a few weeks when the price goes up, I'm going to be able to sell them and make a nice profit. That the underwriter is withholding shares from the public offering. An underwriter must make a legitimate public offering of the stock at the public offering price. They are not allowed to withhold it to try and sell it for more later. Churning. This is the agent doing transactions purely for commissions, but it depends on the client's objectives and goals. You have to check it with their objectives and goals. It isn't a specific number of transactions. I always give two examples. The idea that people think, oh, one transaction a month must be fine. Well, I can give you an example where one transaction a month is churning. And 30 transactions a month, well, that, that must be too much. Well, I can give you an example where 30 transactions a month is just fine. Because I've got this rich friend. This friend's got, 
I don't know, just sold his business for a lot of money. This friend lives in uh, North Car was it North? No, South Carolina. This friend lives in South Carolina, and for some reason, a couple weeks ago, called me and all of a sudden has a lot more money to invest. I'm pretending my friend is the one that won the lottery, the 1.6 billion. Whatever, my friend has this large amount of money, and they come to me and go, well, here's half a million, here's a million dollars. I hear you are the best new stockbroker, Brian. I just want to see what you can do with a million dollars. Do whatever you think is best, make me as much money. I've got so much other money, it doesn't matter. Well, 30 transactions a month might be fine for that client. But then I have this little old client, this little old late, uh, couple client. These two, these, these, these two, they're so sweet. They're like 85, 86. They're wonderful. I go over, they always have cookies and tea and other imaginary things because these people don't really exist. Uh, but I set up these clients a couple years ago with a group of 30-year bonds. And these bonds are solid, solidly um, re uh, con reasonably conservative. Um, they're certainly not government bonds, but they're nice corporate, nice, uh, good credit corporate bonds that are paying 20% more than this couple's monthly needs right now. Okay, so they've got income from these bonds, highly rated, well-qualified well bonds, that are 20% more than they need. What kind of investment would be good for them? What kind of transaction would benefit them? They're 85, 86. Yep, we may have to worry about inflation. Those bonds aren't going to increase over time. But I'm specifically saying it's 20% more than they need. How long is it going to take inflation to eat into that? And they're 85, 86. How long are they going to live? And remember, when one of them passes away, the amount of money that the other one's going to need is going to drop. So even if they're starting to get close to where inflation is no long, is a problem and they're about where the minimum and then one passes, well, the expenses go down. Is any transaction going to benefit them? These people sound like they might be perfect. They might never have to worry about money again. So you've got to look at the objectives, at the goals, the purpose of it, not simply the number of transactions in any given period. Switching is simply churning when you're dealing with mutual funds. The idea of buying and selling within mutual funds. When you buy a mutual fund within the same fund family, you do not have to pay sales charges. So if I have a young client who's in, a, who's in an aggressive mutual fund, and now he's a middle-aged client and wants to be in a more moderate mutual fund, and I sell the uh, aggressive mutual fund at ABC and I buy a moderate mutual fund at ABC there's no sales charge there might be taxes we're gonna get into that in a later chapter might be taxes but there's no sales charge but if I sell their ABC aggressive to buy MNO moderate well there's a new sales charge and I have to justify why I'm doing that is it because it really is what's best for the client that ABC doesn't have a good mid uh, moderate fund that ABC's management made some mistakes and there's some serious real issues and concerns at ABC it cannot simply be that MNO is better rated because the ratings can change year to year you can't sell new new mutual funds every year simply because they're better rated but switching is simply sm selling mutual funds for the idea of generating commissions for the rep not to put the client in a better situation. Selling dividends. Trying to convince a client to buy a security just to receive an upcoming dividend. Selling the stock because of the dividend. When a dividend is announced, when the dividend basically is getting paid out and the record date, when it's getting to the X date and the stock price adjusts because of the dividend, right before the record date, it's gonna be paid soon. The idea is, you give me $50, and on the X date, I'm going to give you $5 bill, because that's what the dividend is, and $45. Because the $5 dividend comes basically from the stock price. So instead of having $50, you've got a $45 stock and a $5 bill coming to you in the mail. So that looks sort of equal. $50 or $45 and $5, I mean, seems equal. Whereas if you wait until after the dividend, you're gonna be doing 45 for a $45 stock, which clearly is equal. The problem with that $50 for a $45 stock and a $5 bill, that sounds equal. $50 on one side, $50 on the other. The problem is that $5 bill has a loophole in it. Well, strings attached, I guess. It's taxable. That $5 is income. 
That $5 is taxable as ordinary income tax. So you actually get a $5 bill and maybe a $1.50 tax bill. So you're actually out money. That's why selling dividends is, is unethical. It actually hurts the client. There is no benefit to buying a stock right before an upcoming dividend announced, as that has been announced. Breakpoint sale is selling an investment just below a breakpoint. Must always notify the clients of the breakpoint sale, the, uh, the, uh, the breakpoints available. If you look at the breakpoint ch uh, chart, at the tables, you'll see that if, I, if someone invests a dollar less than a breakpoint, they're going to be paying more in sales charges than if they invested that dollar more. If the breakpoint's at 25000 and they're giving me $24,999, they're going to be, from the example that we use, they're going to have a 5% sales charge on the 24999 and they'd have, I believe it was four and a quarter at the 25000 Since I, as a rep, get paid off of that commission, off that sales charge, the higher the sales charge, the more that is collected, the more I'm going to get. So I actually have a vested interest in the client giving me less than a breakpoint, just a little bit though. But we must notify the clients of a breakpoint sale. We cannot, we cannot recommend that they borrow. We can't suggest they take a mortgage or they, they, they take a car loan or something. But letters of intent could be used. The idea of they have 13 months to meet it. If they're giving me 24000 today, maybe they don't have another 1000 today. But do they have another 1000 within 13 months? Then we can sign the letter of intent and they can get the discount. Restrictions on associated persons purchasing IPOs, initial public offerings. A member or a person, sorry about that, a member or a person associated with a member, and these are basically full broker-dealers, Series 7 broker-dealers, individual stock uh, and bond broker-dealers. They may not purchase a new issue in any account in which such member or associated person is a beneficial interest. If I was working in, in one of these ways where I would not be able to do this and I was in a joint account with, uh, with people, if there was multiple people and we were all sharing in this, that account would not be able to buy an IPO because I'm involved and I have beneficial interest. I have some ownership control, some ownership stake in that pooled uh, account where this would be purchasing the IPO. Fraud. We must understand no member shall affect any transaction or induce the purchase of or sale using any manipulative, deceptive, or fraudulent means. You can't try and convince people to do something. You got to prevent, uh, present the information. We must understand though that fraud must be known. You cannot accidentally commit fraud. You cannot accidentally commit a criminal act. If we think back to when we were talking about the insider trading and we mentioned that Martha Stewart served time in jail, that means she must have known what she was doing was criminal. Her, her broker, her, the person who called her, must have somehow informed her that it was inside information. You cannot accidentally commit a criminal crime. You can commit a civil crime accidentally. You can accidentally misfile paperwork that does something that gets you a $2,000 civil penalty because of an accident. But fraud must be knowingly committed. You cannot accidentally commit fraud. Borrowing or lending to a client. We cannot borrow or lend to clients who are not in the lending or borrowing business. As in, if we, if we have a client that is a mortgage company or a bank, yeah, we can, borrow, we can lend and borrow from them. The exceptions are immediate family. You can lend and borrow to clients that are your parents or your children. Outside long-term friends. My long-term friend from high school, where we've been friends for 10 or 20 years, and a few years ago, he, he became a client. We're friends before that. Outside business partners requiring lending between them. Jeff and I happen to be working with the same broker dealer, but if we didn't, I would be able to lend to him if he was even if he was a client of mine. And other reps registered with the same member firm. Understand there understand there is a difference between FINRA rules and house rules. 
In many cases, broker dealers have their own rules, such as you cannot lend to other registered reps of the same member firm. My broker dealer has that rule. That is not a FINRA rule. Make sure we don't get them confused. That can be disadvantageous. It can be a problem if we don't realize what is FINRA versus what is house. But you can lend to immediate family, outside the business long-term friends, outside the business business partners, and other registered reps of the same member firm according to FINRA. The registered rep cannot in any way guarantee a profit to the customer. You cannot have a, if you don't like, uh, if, if, if you don't make money, I'll return your fees. I guarantee you're going to make more than this, this thing. Oh, this, 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 uh, this, this investment is, yeah, this investment is assured to make more than the market. Can't do any of that. Sharing in customer accounts. Registered reps cannot share in clients accounts unless there's written procedure in place. The client is aware and the client is agreed and they share in direct proportion to the amounts contributed by all parties. I can't contribute 10%, my client's contributing 90, and I get to keep all of the profits and they keep all of the, and, and they pay all of the losses. Can't work that way. This does not count if it's immediate family. If I happen to have my parents as clients and we have a joint account together and I'm using it to help pay for their retirement where I'm putting money into that account for them. They can take all of it out. They don't need to share in direct. If I'm using it for my children, I could do the same kind of thing. Or if I'm say a new rep just starting out and my parents have given me a bunch of money or putting money into an account to sort of help me get started. I'm a new rep, I moved to a new town to start my business and my parents are assisting me in getting started by giving me rent and things and they're doing it by contributing to this joint account. Well, it's immediate family. So I don't have to share in direct proportion with that account even if my parents are clients as well. Immediate family is exempt and only immediate family in that case. So the investment firm with the title on the wall, dude, the Department of Unrealistic Dividend Earnings. We realize it is an unnecessary department, but the acronym was just too cool to shut it down. <laughs> Influencing employees of other members. We actually covered this, I believe there's two different areas where we talk about this, because they're very related. The idea is you cannot give more than $100 without permission is all of that too. But it's, it's, the issue is gifts of less than 100 are no problem. The problem is what are gifts? We want to be careful when we're looking at the difference between a gift and a marketing expense. Because I am not allowed to be given by ABC Mutual Funds a $1,000 leather jacket. No matter how much I want it, they, they can't do it. Now, if they were to give me a $1,000 leather jacket that had ABC Mutual Funds burned on the back, well, that's not, that's not a gift. That's an advertising expense. I mean, I'm now advertising their, their fund. I mean, that's, that's, that's advertisement. So you got to be careful there. You got to be careful that it's not being done to influence. That is the important thing, bribe. You could think of it as bribery, basically. Maybe not to the sort of the negative connotations that bribery has, but that's what they're sort of worried about. The fact, am I making recommendations to my client to make to, to purchase this investment because it's what's best for the client or because this this person this um, firm over here happens to be giving me a couple hundred bucks buying me a lot of wine or taking me out to dinner every week is that why I'm selling this investment because I want to keep that because I'm gonna get this jacket I'm gonna get this cruise I'm gonna get this car or is it because it's what's best for the client when you're dealing with this as well, make sure that if, if it's a larger amount, if it's above 100, it still could be allowed. Again, if it's a marketing expense, if it's an infrequent dinner or trip to the theater or stadium, uh, some kind of sporting event or musical event or something like that, infrequent and occasional, not a problem. Activities of unregistered persons. They are pro we are prohibited from paying commissions to unregistered persons. They must be a natural person. 
Anyone receiving securities commissions must be a natural person. No S corps, no LLCs, no C corps, certainly no C corps, no um, limited partnerships, none of that. It must be a natural person. Unregistered persons are also not allowed to solicit customers and they cannot take orders. I had a student uh, about a year ago actually who came to me to get to get trained in passing these licenses not because they wanted to be an advisor not because they wanted to be a rep mm -mm, not at all they were very happy being I believe an estate attorney or an accountant I forget which one they were very happy doing that and they had a their, their certified financial planner who's been helping them with their personal investments and things came up with the idea of hey you know if you got your license and were registered at my broker dealer and you referred clients to me I could pay you commissions because then we're both registered at the same company and that is why he went and became a registered rep just so that he could be registered at the same company just so that he could uh, share in the commissions of his referrals Financial exploitation of seniors. These rules permit members to place temporary holds on disbursements of funds or securities from accounts of potentially exploitable seniors where there is reasonable belief of financial exploitation. It requires members to make reasonable efforts to obtain the name and contact information for a trusted contact person. If one of your more, one of your elder uh, clients all of a sudden has this new aid that's coming everywhere with them and they're trying to take out money and they seem to be because the aid wants them to, you may want to report that. You need to work on that. You may need to have a system where you, you have to contact the kids or something like that. Falsifying or withholding documents. Signatures of convenience. These are basically blank forms with maybe blank dates but with the signatures allow easy file filling out later and filing very unethical not allowed the idea of me going to a client going I, I understand you're having trouble with beneficiary decisions how about you just sign this this down here I'll date it later and just email me who you want me to put in here and I'll fill it out and then submit it oh no 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 can't do that no, and nothing can be blank signed if there's a signature it must have been filled out first generally the signature is the last thing that's done Responding to regulatory requests. Any regulatory request must be responded to promptly. I've always loved that, promptly. When they don't give specific times, they just say promptly, soon. Gotta do it quickly. Really? You can't be a little more specific than that? That's a little weird. But that's a promptly one. I think I can get as a tax credit if we start cooking the books with solar heat. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of this unit which is the end of this chapter. I hope you learned a lot in this chapter. This is dealing with the laws and things like that, which are important, which are definitely tested. Make sure that you do go back over anything that you had questions with. Watch the animations, read the additional posts. If you have any questions, please reach out uh, via my email. I'll be glad to get back to you. Hope you enjoyed this. Keep up the good work, and I'll see you in the next chapter shortly.